suddenly you see a Thresh could be roaming towards you. Suddenly you see a champion like Rek'Sai who has excellent uncleansable ganks at level 2 with the Flash on Burrow. And it just becomes so much more risky for Cassiopeia because for such upside, such hyper damage scaling in the late game, she can get preyed upon in lane. So it might just be a bridge too far. They might have to go for something safer. They're hovering Arya. It's locked in. Makes a lot of sense. Yeah, Arya's super safe there. But Udu is locked in there for Bangkok Titans. So someone is moving positions. That might be Gregor's support, but stuff is going on here in this first game. Look, let's just hope it's not Udia's support. As amazing it would be, I'm sure there's the likes of Atlas off screen who are cheering for the Udia support. Not a lot of lane presence coming through from the fiercely melee Udia. We've seen Gragas support, I believe, in the LPL recently. So there are people that are trying to throw out the Gragas support. That was PYL, I believe, from LGD playing the Gragas support. But he played Bard, so maybe we can't do too much. I don't much. know if we can trust PYL, unfortunately, but it's interesting. It's very ambiguous, of course, given that None of these champions look like standard supports. I mean, even Ari could be a support at this stage of the no. game, but, but I mean, no, he's not going to be, but could. <laughs> Gregus does make some sense to me. A lot of his jungle presence just comes from being strong with few items, so that does make sense, but he does benefit so much from Cinder Hulk as well. We'll see what Bashiktas want to do. They've certainly been thrown for a loop here with the Udi being locked in for the Bangkok Titans, and again, sort of running out of time. Take Nidalee away for energy at the last second. I think Nidalee is a big pickup for them. It's one of his comfort champions, not necessarily wave clear but always poke orientated or the wave clear. goes for a little bit of both with the likes of Nidalee melee range wave clear but massive poke coming through this is another champion that he played during the Turkish Champions League final a lot of comfort coming through for Besiktas coming in the favorites playing comfort champions things shape up for them really well especially if they can get that lane swap that we've already driven the point into the ground about lane swap for Besiktas and they have a huge advantage strategically coming into this game yeah but it is the greatest support from Bangkok Titans we have to think here. We're going to get G4 on the Ari and 007X. Well, oh yeah, picked up Gregus, got Sejuani banned against him. He's definitely changing up to the Cinderhog standards. Nope, straight into Udi. Straight Which in. actually makes sense because it's sort of like a really aggressive Nunu. We wondered where he would go with this tank meta that he's so accustomed to. He was great on the Nunu. The Jarvan's falling out of the meta and in general didn't look that impressive on the champion. Probably knew he had to pick up something other than Sejuani because Sejuani is such a popular ban. Goes to the Udia. We've seen other people dipping into the Udia well. We know what he can do. He can be so annoying in the early game. You just worry about late game. Just so prone to getting kited. The likes of Thresh very strong with the flay and any sort of disengage. Not able to wade through the box either. You feel like Udia is kind of a, a very risky bit. It feels a bit like LeBlanc on patches like 5.7. If you get a lot of work done early, get super tanky in the late game with already an objective advantage, Udia can look like an excellent champion. But if Udia falls behind as a fiercely melee champion, he just has those situations where he just doesn't really do anything. I mean, for me, you definitely pick Udia as a jungler just to basically pressure the other jungler. Your ganks are a little awkward given that it's bear stance only. But you do... Sounds like Nunu. Yeah, exactly. That was the thing. He's aggressive Nunu. You get in. Nunu kind of walks in the camps. He stays safe. He snowballs you. He eats your creep. And then he walks away and just keeps track of the jungle. Uda does the same thing. But instead of walking in and snowballing you, he walks in and kills you. Absolutely. I mean, we can all dream of the likes of Poacher's Knife Udia coming through, but that's the play style we're expecting, even if we don't see that particular jungle item picking up. A lot of... A lot of appearances in the enemy jungle, as I believe we have another we champion adjustment. We do. It seems that players are having some trouble maybe selecting their champions, but it was actually Vladimir, not the Nidalee, that was the last pick coming through for Besiktas. So that does change things up quite a bit, actually, for the Turkish lineup. I mean, it's just so much late game power coming through. Do they want to isolate this lane? I still say probably yes, even though Vladimir going to struggle in the early game against Ari. It's always the Hextech Revolver and moving towards level 9 for a bit more lane presence. And in the late game, Jinx Vladimir, you don't need to say much more than that for damage. A bit of an assist coming through from the likes of Maokai and Rek'Sai, but it's definitely going to be two massive damage threats coming through for Besiktas. Yeah, I mean, just take a step back there and think about that combination. Hemo Plague plus the Jinx ultimate's already enough, but the fact that in Rocket Launcher form, you get AoE as well, potentially AoE crits coming through with, 12 with the Infinity more Edge. damage, of yeah, course. not too bad, as it sounds. Yeah, I mean, Infinity Edge into Hemo Plague is a disgusting combination when the critical strikes come through. 250%, 12% bonus on top of that. Not exactly sure how that interacts, but we're talking about 280% crit damage. We're talking about a lot of damage from the Jinx. So the lane swap, that's the big question though. I'm really going to be looking for that level one. Suddenly, and it's worth noting actually that while it doesn't take the smite in this case, you would feel that if they got into a lane swap, smite would really help out the Hecum so he could actually pick up those jungle camps easier, but going for the laning option in Ignite. 
Yeah, I mean, we've seen this already, I think, as well. It was just Swiper, I think, from the Chiefs who took away that smite, adapting that new Cinderhawk style that we've seen in the top side. But Ignite, it makes sense. These teams, are, we've kind of characterized them already. Aggression seems to be the name of the game for a lot of them. And with Hecarim, we talked about his early game can be a little bit awkward sometimes. Why not just get a little bit more kill pressure to help you out in the early stages? And doing my research on these regions, some regions just don't pick up the smite, whether they're not used to it. Of course, Flandre bringing it onto the scene in the LPL only about three, two and a half weeks ago. It's a very new thing to adapt to. I just feel like having that challenging smite opens up Hecarim to fulfill his role in teamfights so much earlier. Challenging smite onto an AD carry doesn't matter if you don't have the burst damage from Trinity Force. You can still occupy all of their time. Well, we'll have to see how it shakes out as we are onto the rift here for Bangkok Titans versus Bashikta C versus Turkey here for the International Wildcard Invitational. And do not adjust your screens. That is a 007X Udia. We wondered where he would go in this meta. Known for his tank jungles. Nunu taken away. Sejuani, the most obvious movement from there, taken away. And we zoom into definitely not Udia on the rift. Happily dancing. And of course, that does leave the early pick, Gragas, that might have, th again, thrown Bashiktas for a bit of a loop. That's actually down in the bottom side for Moss on support. So... Relic Shield Grug is going to be the mix-up. Besiktas looks very standard. This is a pr look, a practice-looking, late-game oriented comp. And Nadius is already in the top lane looking for that lane swap. But Bangkok Titans, they came to play and they have mixed it up already. Bangkok Titans haven't sniffed out the lane swap just yet. You can tell from the fact that the red team's bottom lane is on the top side of the map. That it's definitely a lane swap initiated by Besiktas. Moss just throwing over a couple barrels to help out Udia. He's going for a dance, maybe a little drink as well, before he gets to his first I camp. Mean, by the look of that uh, bear form, best dance, Udia dance, that was a very clever bit of flavor coming through there from the Bangkok Titans. As we are going to get the Phoenix leveled up first, 007X is going to wander down to the bottom side of the map, and it seems like Krug's into red is where he'll start. Theocles, we already praised his Rek'Sai and champion, said this guy finds ganking parts you wouldn't expect. And Rek'Sai, the unique thing about her is that she can do a bit of a Shaco impression, come over thick walls that you wouldn't expect with the unburrow, then even potentially flash instantly into position for the unburrow. So she's very flexible with her ganking pass and a smart jungle like Theocles. Suddenly, we mentioned this in Champions League, if we do see the lane swap, you're going to have to be so much more accountable with G4 as Nadius already starts the freeze. And we move into a pause. Yeah, we do have a pause. As Dumbledore seems to be having a slight connection issue, but we said it in the draft. We were looking for the lane swap coming through from the Turkish side, and lo and behold, that's exactly what we got. The freeze has even been started as well by Nadia. So you have to think, even with the pause here in just the first few minutes of the game, Turkey exactly where they want their early game to be. And Besiktas, uniquely, they do have a lot of experience enacting the lane swaps. Some of these regions, you just don't see a lot of lane swaps. Oceania, for example, that were most... Uh, comfortable with Chiefs, they can do the lane swap, but a lot of other teams don't opt into that lane swap situation. Besiktas very practice on it and get a lot of advantages. Again, opens up that Dumbledore's room that we're so excited to see this game. Even just on a simple level, the laning matchups, you actually do want to dodge, as weird as it sounds, the Graves, uh, Graves Gragas lane, just because we're talking about intense burst damage coming out from that dude. The one thing you can say about support Gragas, just take a drink. The Drunken Rage into just the body slam. It's instant CC. It's a big amount of burst damage. Graves all about the burst. It can be a difficult lane. And we're talking about Thresh, who can never get a lot of lanes. Historically, one of his most difficult lanes was against the likes of Annie, who's known for her burst. Gragas is much the same story, and it's good to dodge out that lane if you're Besiktas. I mean, it's so hard to poke out Graves' Gragas as well. They're both fairly tanky. Graves' passive helping him out there. Happy Hour, Gragas' passive helping him as well, plus the Relic Shield. Even if you could afford to poke them out with some Flay Autos and maybe some Jinx Minigun or Rockets, they're, just never, they're always going to be topped up in that lane, it feels like. And that's why it's a surprise that Bangkok Titans couldn't try to maybe group as five, look for some of that aggressive vision, sniff out that lane swap, because suddenly, don't have to be as accountable as Dumbledore can do that big roaming. Suddenly, Hecarim doesn't have Smite, so he'll pick up that first camp, but doesn't have the opportunity to just leave lane when the freeze comes. So that's the big thing you can say about taking Smite as a Hecarim, is that he's a champion that's so fiercely melee, even with that Rampage, only farming at 350 range. If he's in a freeze situation, he walks into lane, can't really get much experience, doesn't have flash if he overextends. The ability to pick up Smite, just go pick up some jungle camps elsewhere, then come back to lane when the lane starts to push up, is already another strategic thing that works in the advantage of Hecarim. So he's looking for a 1v1 with that Summoner Spell Ignite and doesn't get it. Yeah, I mean, and 
that's common, I think, of a lot of the regions attending this event. Known for aggression, known for wanting to have more standard lanes and sort of play into the early game. But Jik just a team that can kind of dodge around that and they've done well in the early stages to get there. I guess my question is, how much of an advantage can they get off the swap? Because they've enacted it correctly. They seem to have a very advantageous position, but they have to make it count here. And the Bangkok Titans, you know, just from the picks that they've selected with the Graves, with the likes of a jungle Udyr, that the way they win this game is by getting aggressive in the early stages. So one thing that Bangkok Titans can do, so remember, this is a red side team lane swapping to the top lane. So the big thing to consider there is that they're going to be jungling on the top side of the map. That opens up the bottom side of the map. Udyr, very sustained jungler, very safe, can pick up that early dragon. They're going to have four members on the bottom side of the map. They need to start the objective snowball by picking up the dragon before the counter lane swap comes through. We're expecting maybe an item timing to be hit, whatever the situation. Make the enemy team accountable by picking up objectives with the side of the map that you have multiple members on. And for me, it's not just the first dragon because in that situation... That's the snowball from yeah, there. That's the trade that you accept in any sort of situation when you lane swap. I mean... That's it's always been that way, I have to think. Ever since people stopped fast pushing, you just say, like, all right, we're not going to trade towers anymore, so you get the first dragon. Enjoy it. Take it away. But you don't get gold from it anymore. You just get the first one. So being able to get the next few and making sure you hit that second dragon timing, that's where Bangkok Titans really need to focus their objective control. And look, because they're not used to lane swap situations, we can't say for sure. We can't assume we're going to see a four or five minute dragon. It's still a big question mark to me. Do we see them understand that that's the big advantage they get from controlling their bottom side and have the confidence to go for dragons remember this is their first game on the international stage in this situation their first game they're in turkey a long way away from thailand they need to understand that this is the strategic uh opportunity they've been opened up to and really take advantage of it and the earlier they do it as you mentioned the earlier the second the third and the snowball can be from there and it's aggression for me how aggressive can they get their mid laner especially in that udir that's a surprise pick from 007x it's not the nunu it's not some of the tank junglers that he looked like he might be picking up as well it's something hyper aggressive almost on the udir and there's a timer on this game absolutely especially with the vladimir jinx both of those champions once they hit level nine once they're good to go if there's not some sort of discernible lead for Bangkok Titans, they will start to struggle towards the mid-late stages. And again, as the game goes on, it gets harder and harder for a jungle like Udyr, who needs to get into melee range with that bear stance to have any real impact in a gank. To gank of Vladimir, of course, you're going to open up so much distance. Double escape summons, the ghost flash already taken. Going to have the sanguine pull to disengage. If we see that Udyr bear stance coming through, you can essentially pop the projectile, in this case, the auto attack with the sanguine pull. Going to have to be really on point with chaining that into the charm and picking up the kill when they can. Because as you mentioned, scales so well, ability power, giving him health, becoming more sustainable in the mid lane. It feels like it's only the first six levels, specifically level six, where Ari has a good time to push out the Vladimir with that Udia ari synergy. And Ari is going to be the big player here. It's G4, uh, G4 is already the big player here for his team. He's all known as the carry. They're a very mid lane centric team when they play. He's on Ari. That's a great champion for snowballing these types of team compositions. So how much work can he get done? And for me, can he hold down the Vladimir? Because we've talked about it. When Vlad gets going in the lane, he's almost impossible to kick out. I think it goes further than that. Remember, the AD carry they've selected to combine with the Ari is Graves, who's mostly a burst damage champion. In the late game, going to really have to respect the range advantage, the likes of Jinx, the Hemo play, basically any CC. The shorter range you are, the more abilities you have to respect because getting into auto attack range puts you at... Uh, potential cost of even just Tides of Blood damage, all the Hemo Plague, all the Transfusion coming through. So as a shorter range carry, going to be more about burst in the late game. So returning to the like, likes of Ari has very short cooldown rotations, does pick up some CDR, and suddenly we're talking about sub five second cooldowns. Again, now you even more need the mid lane Ari to snowball. Because look, in the late game team fights, you'd always take a Vladimir unless the Ari gets strong enough that each of her spell rotations is chunking out tanks, let alone backline carries. And I guess looking at these team compositions, going through the, going through both of them in quite a bit of detail, I feel like we have a good grasp of what Bashik just want to do. And we've certainly gone through most of the Bangkok Titans. But I guess my question for you is. What's this Hecarim doing in the team comp? Because he's the one that doesn't really fit with the same mid-game philosophy that the rest of the team comp seems to have. I think it's a bit of late-game insurance. I mean, maybe I'm discounting the fact that burst and consistent damage is what is possible if Hecarim gets strong enough. We're skeptical. We're waiting to see whether in a lane swap with Teleport Ignite, the Hecarim can get to that big-game stage. Very interesting to see what item build we see coming through because 
I, I believe Spawn was mentioning it on cast earlier. It's just a really nice, smooth power curve when we're talking about the likes of the Cinder Hulk, which of course makes all your future health purposes purchases that much better. Into the with the challenging smite also that lets you just you know use that ultimate, the onslaught of shadows, onto an AD carry, throw on the challenging smite, and basically force them out of a fight. Into the Trinity Force for the burst damage, and again with just the home guard boots for a bit more reliability on those teleport ganks. When you don't have that first item Cinder Hulk to pick up. A lot of people kind of disagree on builds. Some people just rush into a phage, then maybe build for lane with the likes of a Spectre's Cowl or a Glacial Shroud for that matter. Some people just go straight for the Trinity Force and then you start kind of want to pull the game a little bit later just so that you can get a bit of tankiness to go with that burst damage. Itemizing as a Hecarim, if you're not going for the Cinder Hulk, can sometimes be a little tricky. It's, I guess, based on gold values to some degree. I think, honestly, even with Cinder Hulk, it can be tricky as well. Hecarim's got such weird curves almost because he does have a very strong point of power especially towards the late game but getting there is the hard part that's why people started mixing it up okay Cinderhawk's pretty good let's mix that in there but Cinderhawk yeah reasonably high impact but obviously benefits more from the items you build after it and that's my biggest thing with Hecarim his what's his two item what does that look like and in this case it's probably I mean it's two items Trinity Force into Home Guard boots, sure right? or otherwise it's Cinderhawk into Trinity Force sure. into Tanky sure but how does he get there is the question then if, if we've identified that his two item is is the thing that's important to look at. For me, the Trinity Force timing is always key because Hecarim's a bruiser. He's one of the true bruisers that's seeing a lot of play at the highest level of competition. How tanky is he when he gets to do his two items and when's he going to get the Trinity Force? But we are popping back into the game and Nadius executing his freeze wonderfully. here, just going to slowly last hit the top wave. We'll wait to see if there's actually any difference in when these creeps actually hit the turret. That's the big part timers and how you, well you control the waves to ensure they keep pushing as the subsequent waves come in on the minimap. Can't really tell at this point. The hard freeze going on. Udia doing a bit of farming. And Thresh actually going to peek up to top, maybe pick up a couple levels, and the roam will be on. Yeah, I like this from Moss, actually starting the blue up, up for his jungler as well. Wants to get the ward down, 007X going to come in, and we might even see a support follow here as well. We haven't quite talked about it, but Kragas, again, a jungler known for early game pressure and CC. Not quite Thresh on levels of roam, but not too shabby. I mean, the level too, if we're talking about the flash bodies, how much the flash bear slap, all those things are very relevant. So it'd be something different. They could even maybe get the Drunken Rage and opt into the earliest dragon we've seen so far in the IWCI. Looking at the minimap, looks like they're just trying to pick up the Rift Scuttler, but the dragon, a very realistic option for Bangkok type. Yeah, they might even look to take it away after they pick up the Scuttler as they seem to be walking back to the Grom. We are going to have the blue buff taken away, of course, so Besiktas will be jungling on the top side of the map. And we saw the free starter by Nadius, but Dumbledore's just not roaming. He's actually helping Jinx fast push. This is super fast push. They're trying to bait the teleport to top lane because with four members meeting there after picking up the Gromp, no flash available on Hecarim, he would die instantly. So, so far, Warlock's been very smart not to try to enter this lane. Thaldron's still showing himself. They're taking their time to shore themselves with a four-man group, but now you can see everyone's in the top lane. They're trying to start the frost yep, push. Four people pushing. Might even stop proxying the way, but a great response here by the blue side going into that early dragon. So, we talked about responding to these sort of lane swaps. So far, the first four minutes has looked great by both sides. I mean, the big thing here for Bangkok Titans though is that if you answer this turret for a dragon it's going to be an instant boost of gold suddenly you have more roam items maybe close to the mobility boots coming out for thresh it's going to be more gold in general and if you can't answer the turret you're going to have a situation where when the swap comes back when we see the likes of nadius and dumbledore's coming back to the bottom lane you're going to have to really overextend with a no-flash top laner like Hecarim, and that's where the wraparound ganks will come from the likes of Theocles, who can already be very creative with his ganking part. So this turret will fall down very, very soon, and the question will be, where did Besiktas go from there? Because they're not so much about the single rotations. They're looking to back because this lane has started to push back. Yeah, it's interesting. They're not looking to fast push now after getting so low. Yeah, they held the way back, and they're actually going to freeze it here once again. So Dumbledore, unable to roam here but not leaving quite yet, does take the cannon creep though away as well. Well, now recall potentially will look for a roam there as well, but we do have Moss actually rotating to the top side, but that's very dangerous at this stage. Yeah, it's only the support, remember. We see Gragas on the minimap. Might be forgiven for thinking that it's a top lane or all the likes of a jungle, but it's only the support coming through. Doing a bit of warding. Hecarim is going to slowly walk to the top lane. They've definitely prep this turret earlier. Maybe they're just looking for a very creative turret dive where they just wipe out the turret and then suddenly Jinx gets excited and they pick up the kill. But it is surprising to even put so much effort into damaging down this turret. 
And it's not finish it off. It's on literally 100, 150 health. Yeah, I like that Moss is here as well. Warlock has to think he's getting it's baited. It's suspicious at this yeah, point. Yeah, it's very suspicious. And even Udi is going to come up as well. But actually outnumbered in the top side of the map right now, Arba Shikta's. So Warlock will get plenty of farm here with his friends by to help him. Yeah, the vertical jumbling ended very, very quickly in this game. No more vertical jungling going 2v2 action in the top. No dragon spawning for another six, five minutes or so. So just standard lanes at this point. Graves versus Maokai, though. That's the result of all these changes. The Maokai definitely going to find an easier time oh to get from the bar. Oh, my God. Going in energy. Got so low from an all-in by G4. And 007X flashing over the Raptor cam to try and get the kill. That was uh, speculative, to say the least. He tried to be super secret agent Udi at 007. Could not pull it off. Going to get a bit of turret damage down, but now the flash is down, and suddenly his gank presence goes from low to really low. Yeah, but great stuff from G4. Only used his ignite there in the trade in Vladimir's defense. Did keep both of his summoners up as well, but good early pressure. Energy, though, able to get up quite high on health. Actually had a few potions there, starting boots, three pots, it looks like there. So an early lead to the RE like we expect, but Vlad holding out just fine, especially after dodging the Udi gank. So after that damage trade came down, Vlad was always going to be on the backside. We were going to expect... To Ari to keep pushing in bottom. Graves has had, Lloyd especially, has had basically permanently pushed bot lane. That should have empowered Udia to have so much presence in the enemy jungle, get that counter jungling going that we talked about in Champions Select. But now that his flash is down, it's kind of awkward because even though he's very tanky, getting caught, you're caught. And speaking of getting caught... Yeah, Lloyd getting aggressed on Dumbledore's here as well. The Oculus also there. He does get body slammed back. Moss will get hooked away, but the teleports come through for Warlock running in on top. They want to get so aggressive but can't quite find it without the ultimates available. And lots of trades back and forth. Cooldown's blown, but no one dies. They definitely didn't have the CC to pull off a successful game. They will lose at least this turret, though, to be honest. was already super low. The big factor is, does Hecarim lose this massive minion wave after being denied from farm for so long? You can see in the rocket launcher form, just to push this wave in as fast as possible. Udia, hopefully, 007X, honestly, his best move here would to be fr to, to freeze the lane and get that high item cap Udi, uh, Hecarim, who needs at least the Trinity Force to be relevant as much of the CS as possible, and he pulls it off well. Yeah, that's exactly what he's doing. They even pops into Turtle Stance just to shake off some of the incoming minion damage. But Warlock, a null magic mantle in the inventory to join in with some early boots of speed. I think he has an idea about how he's going to catch up here, and it's just wanting to go for the home guards. And look, he really wants to have the same presence as, well, look at this. Oh, look at you. Looking all handsome in there as well. Thanks to Destroyer. Those watching on, looks like two different screens, a laptop and a TV. Very creative. Very affluent members that we have of the party. We've seen three, four monitors. Everyone's got their sick setup going. Yeah, and that's good. Again, want to know how you guys are watching. So keep sending those in as Warlock holding his wave now on the top side of the map as well. Wanted to make sure it stays here for as long as possible. And like I said, I'm expecting some early home guards. So he wants to just be as influential as he can when he does get his ultimate. So lots of credit to the Bangkok Titans. They've been very smart. They picked up the early dragon. The next one's coming very soon. We're seeing a damage trade. Yeah, ulti that comes through. Ooh. Moss forced to flash away. Lloyd. Pops the heal in there as well. 007X also now looking towards the bottom side of the map. Can maybe bait them in here. Now he's no going to run in. Going. The Udi's coming in on the bed. It's ulti already used. Moss dives in massively. Dumbledore's in trouble. Not going to get slow, but Lloyd needs one more auto attack. And first blood goes to Graves. They're even able to pass it over to Graves. Ideal in that situation. Tried to split the difference. Hope they could get the double kill. But Nadius still had the flash rebel. Ari, though. G4 wants to dive in. Does have his ultimate going to go in. You have to think. Teleport come through now as well. Charm just going to miss. But they'll go in massive, wonderful orb of deception. Able to take out the kill on Thaldron. Now in trouble, gonna get doped by Moss. Gets the body slam in. Smite down there as well. 007X looking for the kill. We'll go over to Udi. He'll die in the trade. But a two for one and a turret for the Bangkok Titans. They weren't able to ideally pull off the jungle. Sorry, the, the turret juggling. But they still pick up the kills. And the second objective comes through. They had the dragon already. Next one in 35 seconds. If they can put up a bit of vision, shop with the massive influx of gold, they just picked up, they will be an excellent spot to secure this second dragon. Great movement back from Warlock. Had the wave frozen in the bot, so transition to the mid lane just to cover there. And Ari G4 massive dive there as well. Comes back to lane against the Revolver with the Morella Nomicon. And speaking of massive, not just that mid lane itemization, Pickaxe and BF Sword on a champion like Graves here from Lloyd, who has so much burst potential with that flat AD. This Jinx will eventually get to the point where she has a lot of flexible options when her trading starts to get strong against Graves. When she picks up the range on her a rocket launcher form in general, but at this present point, has to respect the power timings coming through from Lloyd. So Bangkok Titans jump out to 3-1 to one and kills the turrets. Tight, of course, after the early pushes coming through. And only a slim lead here for Bangkok Titans. 
are up a dragon as well, and most importantly, the second dragon is now available. Look, they've been very smart in their rotational play. That was something that we had, we had a big question mark about the Bangkok Titans, really showing the, the uh, Southeast Asia region proud with their smart usage in the lane swap situation, in the early rotations, playing very smart. The second dragon is live. No one started off yet. Teleport's not available, so it'll be an isolated 4v4. Yeah, Theocle is actually using his ultimate towards the top side. We'll sense out the Udyr with the Tremor Sense Moss. There is all maybe caught out, but Theocles maybe a bit too aggressive. It's 2v3 right now as they are going to go in, but Dumbledore's joins in. Lands the hook on a 007X, but Warlock's joined in. The ulti there for Jinx. Warlock's taking a massive burst of damage and goes down to energy. 007X forced to flash out as G4 gets the kill onto the Rex side. Charm lands there as well as support. Gragas going to fall also, and Ari runs away there with the Orbit Deception speed, but a two-for-one trade this time for Besiktas. Yeah, the two-for-one trade suits them well, but it's important to notice that Nadius walked all the way from the bottom lane to try and get some kill involvements. Of course, did with the Super Mega Death Rocket splash damage, but it gives up plenty of time for Graves to push up bottom, try to get the equalize this CS advantage. Picking up this turret, though, that'd be a big win for Bishida. This is the mid turret. Suddenly, they've already been very, un they've always been very on point in their vision game, and you have so much more space to get aggressive wards down when you take out that outer mid turret. Surprising to me that G4 didn't want to defend that turret with a blue buff Ari, but maybe just felt a little uncomfortable with three members pushing in. So the early turret advantage will go to the Turkish side there. 2 1 up now in turrets, but maybe with people backing away, that dragon's still available as well. It's surprising. They had the timing. They were in position. They had just taken down the turret, you remember, as Dragon was spawning. But they haven't got any pink wards or any exclusive vision around this area. And even now, looking at the minimap, it's still quite risky. They still have a lot of darkness in the enemy jungle when it comes to DPSing down a quick second dragon. You can see wards in general being put back down. Supports now have their sight stone, so look for the warding to increase. Dumbledore as well has a pink ward in the inventory. Scuttlecrab will go down to the Thai team as they'll take it out and get some vision around the dragon. But looking to push in. Theocles eats a charm there. Good chunk coming through, but Lloyd, so aggressive, goes in, flashes with the ulti, but gets hooked after it. But Moss going to join in as well, and that is some Graves play. That was some instant aggression. I thought it was Riven for a second there. Animation cancelling to get the melee range buckshot. Aggression, we thought the advantage would go to Bangkok Titans, and you see right there why. Yeah, and they get a pick and take the dragon. That's the style that they're importing here into the Wildcard Invitational from Southeast Asia. And it's looking wonderful so far. Still not quite with a gold lead, but keeping on top of those objectives. I mean, I can understand why Theocles was surprised. How often outside of laning phase do you see flash initiations from AD carries of all things? Didn't go for the quick draw, which has that slight... Uh, animation just went for the instant flash into death coming through and they pick up the objective Not so worth it have to say 007x hanging out does take away the Krogs there's energy gonna walk back to lane as well abyssal scepter's been completed there for the vladimir so getting a bit stronger now as well as we look down no other major items completed right yet it looks like daldra and the maokai gonna be working on a righteous glory i believe and we have to kind of temper our excitement at the fact that bangkok titans are squarely in this game because they're certainly not in any semblance of an advantage 20.5k gold for for both these teams are almost identical in the goal. In fact, identical at this point. They have the two dragons in the pocket, and we've seen that teams, the dragon snowball can definitely be a massive win condition for the Bangkok Titans, but they certainly haven't opened up a lot of space. And looking at these comps, we said it during Champions that we have to remind the viewers again, the scaling advantage, Vladimir Jinx, need say no more. The late game team fights look squarely in the advantage of Besiktas. Yeah, and it's that gold lead being even certainly does mean to me that the objectives are the big thing here in this game. It's dragons for the Titans and Besiktas looking for towers or maybe just to keep themselves afloat as far as gold goes so they can get to the mid late stages, pick up some extra global gold as well, and then carry themselves through some of the later team fights. So the Bangkok Titans, they have to start putting more pressure on now. They've got some good items coming through. Graves, I believe, has now finished his Infinity Edge. So things looking good from that stage, but their jumping off point starts very soon. In I fact, probably starts right now. And that's the thing. They need to use their power spikes, but simply, I think the whole change in 2015, having this st stacking dragon mechanic, just opens up teams like the Bangkok Titans that you think, okay, this team's going to get outscaled. How are they going to win the late game? If you've got five dragons, suddenly a lot of these little advantages that, that champions will have, synergies that come through, are kind of outdone by 12% bonus stats, AP and AD, all the stacking bonuses that come through. Suddenly, you can take and win fights. You can siege turrets that wouldn't be possible otherwise. So the minimum at this point was to hope for the Bangkok Titans was to get an advantage in the early game. They haven't been able to do that in gold, but the dragons, that's a still a, a win condition that they're square on time and early for you, I have to say. That's two dragons. 
in less than 15 minutes of the game. Yeah, and they didn't quite hit the second on the dot, but it's been strong dragon control so far. That's certainly what they've been known for regionally, I believe, as well. So good to see them bring that here to a big international tournament, still be able to perform. I guess our other thing to be aware of is Warlock's Hecarim as well. I haven't quite kept tabs on him with all the action that's been going on, but you kind of talked about him as maybe an insurance policy there from the top side of the map. If he's getting consistent farm there as well, that might be something to look for because all of a sudden we get to an even mid game, but one team is more aggressive. Hecarim might be able to tip the balance of some of those very important key fights right in the middle. And think about the Bangkok Titans front lines, the likes of Hecarim, Gragas, and the Udia coming through. Udia, so tanky. We saw, of course, uh, Unicorns of Love playing that Udia. One thing you could say, okay, didn't pick up a win, but was super tanky in the front line, even in a big gold disadvantage. The thing about Jinx, she has mobility in a fight, but it's so gated around the first kill. Getting the first kill on a front line, the likes of Hecarim, Udia, and Gragas is going to be super difficult for the Jinx. So Hecarim hits those item timings, dives into the back line. No option for Jinx to pick up the first kill just because that front line's so tanky. Drunken Rage even making Gragas relatively tanky. She doesn't get excited. The challenging, well, not the challenging spot in this case, but this is the burst damage from the likes of the Trinity Force and the Ignite coming out from the Hecarim. Take down that Jinx, and it's just a one threat comp. It's just the Vladimir coming through from Bushiktas. So again, that's, that's a good point. We need to really keep our eyes on how this Hecarim is farming and what his itemization is. Because it's not always the Trinity Force rush, but the Trinity Force with a bit of tankiness, that's when Hecarim really wants to opt into those team fights. Yeah, he's going to be getting it at some point here. And given the nature of the game, I think he might just go for it straight here again. They've managed to keep up. They're not behind. Maybe not as ahead as they would like, despite being ahead in kills. The goal difference very even so far. So we'll see how that develops. And you're right, when it comes to these late game oriented two threat crumps, the Vlad Jinx plus frontline or utility that we've basically seen from the Turkish side here. It is about getting them both ahead enough. The, I guess the nice thing is, when you can't pin down both of them in a late game situation, you do run into problems because you need to kill both of them. But if one of them's behind or you're able to kill one and then the other just can't do a whole lot because, again, you're kind of in a, mid, uh, a more middle stage of the game, then... That's a team fight that uh, Bangkok Titans can absolutely win. And they have disengage options. I think the Gragas might actually be a big consideration in the late game just because the one thing you can say about Vladimir Jinx, lots of consistent damage coming out. Vladimir in the late game has those sub six second cooldowns on both his AoE ability and the transfusion as Lloyd. That was some real fast feet. He didn't have flash, remember, but was not punished for it. Yeah, did not get ganked there. We had three people actually in the area as they might even look to dive here in the bottom side. Lloyd does not have help, although it's on the way. Ulti's just to clear the wave out. Smoke screens the last two creeps as well. And look at the mind games just running towards the enemy and they run straight in the opposite direction. Being able, as Graves, a short range carry whose wave is really about getting in a few auto attacks and then getting a melee range for Buckshot. Gragas on the top side of the map. The fact that he even bought this extra 20-25 seconds for this turret to come down is relevant because it opens up a lot of action in other lanes. Unfortunately, G4 goes for the run, doesn't get anything out of it, but it was smart play from the great. It was actually very clever the first time when he ducked out of lane just to be like, uh-oh, she's coming. I don't want to get ganked here. It unfortunately, couldn't buy enough time for the gank as Theocles looking for something in the top side. Just finds the Scuttle Crab for now as we will see the blue buff possibly just given over here to energy for some cooldown reduction and again if Besiktas are holding strong here at this stage of the game that's where they want to be with their comp 3-1 now up in turrets as well yeah, ironically no mana jungler and no mana mid Vladimir, a bit like Zed, very gated around cooldowns for consistent damage in fights. Don't really need it for the laning phase because already your transfusion, your big laning item is on a very short cooldown. Warlock, though. Yeah, he's been ganked. Forced the ulti out there as well, but they might still be able to keep chasing. Flash Arcane Smash will knock him up. Very tanky, though, is the Hecarim just from the uh, W, but Warlock does end up getting the kill. The Thai top laner does fall down that situation, but Shitat's back away but not able to pick up any objectives from this big situation. They can push onto the turret, Baron, not a realistic objective. In fact, not even spawning for three and a half minutes at this point. Oh, the the Oculus is actually getting caught. Very nice combo there from G4. Gets the first kill. Thaldron now in trouble. Is 007X going to run in. The Orbit Deception clips him a second time. Flash forward there. His energy is also in the area. Wants to go in. Massive flash from Ari. Hemo plague down now as well. But Vladimir might get himself kited. And 007X keep going. The teleport's teleport. coming in. Yeah, coming through for Warlock. Wants to go in. Going to dive in onto the Vlad who is forced to flash away. Both summoners now burnt as well. They'll keep chasing. Energy getting low. Gets ignited by the Hecarim. Slowed by the Udyr. And Warlock picks up that kill. That was really 
poor play from Besiktas. They got the pick, but there were no objectives to pick up. The outer turret and top had already gone down. They overstayed for a gromp of all things and were punished. Now the snowball starts for Ari. We mentioned the fact that she gets strong enough to do damage to both the front line and the back line in the fight when it suddenly becomes super risky to dive in as the relatively squishy Ari. Death cap already completed. This is a scary, scary 17-minute Ari. And I actually like the very subtle Gragas Ari synergy. This massive Ari now who can dive in. If anything goes wrong or you just need to separate someone, Gragas holds a great tool for an Ari that's now very short range. And that's just the kind of the happy thing that's come out of all the Gragas changes and nurse that come through, is that people finally appreciate the explosive cast for its utility, not as AOE 1 AP 60 second nuke that it was originally. Suddenly you can use it for disengage it. That's why we see the rise of the likes of Lulu, Nunu, Gragas comp, comps with the likes of Jinx or other hyper carries. You can use it in jungle ganks just for displacement either offensively or defensively. It's such a unique ability. It has so much utility in both a winning and a losing team fight. The Gragas support it's a bit of a mind game, absolutely, but it can be very useful. Yeah, it's looked great so far here. As aggressive wards being put down by Bangkok Titans as well. One's going to spot Jinx, maybe even walking just down the lane. Lloyd coming back. Infinity Edge Zeal there for the Graves as well. And you can see why the Bangkok Titans are trying to get vision on the right-hand side of the map, because that Dragon, he's back in 35 seconds. Important to note, no teleport for Hecarim. So they're going to have a difficult decision here with the Bangkok Titans. The third Dragon, especially with a Hecarim comp, has so many synergies. Hecarim and Udia suddenly that much harder to kite. Hecarim actually getting damage from his passive with the 5% movement speed. Again, the picks become easier from Ari. Movement speed already always a very relevant stat, but it's definitely got a lot going on in the Bangkok Titans when it comes to movement speed synergy. But it's going to be an outnumbered situation. So Bangkok Titans, they need a pick before they even attempt what will still be an even numbers drag. Smartly, they're moving Warlock over now as well, who looks like he's pushed out the top wave back in their team's favor. It's so a long walk for Maokai to get to this lane. It's a long walk before he can really start making them pay in a global sense. So this is the time to start the dragon before Maokai can choose between influencing the team fight or taking down an inner turret. Yep, and they're going to get Warlock and 007X on top of it. Maokai has to come now if he wants to, and it seems like Besiktas might just be giving up the dragon the seaside once again going to get their third straight and this is just the value of being on blue side getting lane swapped on and being able to punish it just from picking up the dragon on spawn the second one a bit delayed the third one coming up basically on spawn seeding away a first dragon a second dragon sure i mean they opted into seeding away the first dragon but the third one of all things suddenly udia that hard much harder to ca to kite in a team fight suddenly hecarim that much stronger even without the trinity force being completed they're giving away a lot of advantage here to bangkok titans and answering it besiktas with the, an enemy blue buff not really the biggest, especially onto Theocles of all champions without any resources. I mean, we already talked about it. They don't really have a good blue buff person anyway. Jinx would have been the best if she was in the top side, but currently in the bottom farming the rest of the waves. 007X going to take away the Scuttle Crab there as well. He's getting spotted out here. The Tremor Sense maybe being tricked ever so slightly, but Warlock going to check the bush and finds a Maokai instead. Going to start the team fight there. They'll fight very tanky, but Moss rotating in as well. 007X wrapping all the way around the top as well. Daljun gets knocked up. Ultimate use there as well. They want this kill and they'll try and take it. No flash here from the Malka and he will go down to Moss. The Shiktas always have members in this blue side jungle of Bangkok Titans with no objectives to take. It's a fourth kill they've picked up as a bonus, you'd have to say. Hecarim doesn't get the kill credit, but again, the snowball continues faster towards that Trinity Force. Besiktas, I'm not really sure what they're looking to do because they're usually an objective-focused team. They've taken out the outer ring of turrets. It's the next step that's left them a bit puzzled with Dragon being monopolized by Bangkok Titans. Yeah, and the Titans now building up an advantage. 1,500 gold ahead, so not a massive lead, but starting to get further and further ahead. You can see Warlock's finished up his Trinity Force. Didn't need the emergency home guards that I thought he might have. Just some Merc Treads, an extra null magic mantle, and now a very nicely timed T-Force. And look, I mean, Besiktas can rest in the fact that that late game looks wonderful for them. They still have those synergies we speak about. But late game against a fifth Dragon team suddenly doesn't look so wonderful. Suddenly looks like a struggle. They need to get those 6% stats. It's G4. He's very strong, but can't get the pick just yet. No, not quite. Maokai a little too tanky there with the Merc Treads and the Catalyst. Even the Frozen Heart finish to help fight the Udu and the Graves in particular. Even Hecarim doesn't really like all the armor. But we do have a lock for 007X. He's got his Cinder Hulk and the Giant's Belt up now as well. Lloyd with two items all also there on the top side of the map, and I love all the CDR coming out from Moss. We mentioned the Bangkok Titans need to really put their foot on the gas in the mid-game, and they're doing so right now. That's the third.
third turret now to equalize. So many of the wing just being hit. 007X. Yeah, gets hooked up. They're knocked up as well by the Rek'Sai. Warlock going to dive straight in. And Moss goes in as well. Nadi is getting chunked up by the Ari. Goes down. And 007X still alive finally. Falls there as well. But Energy getting run around as well. Lloyd's going to join in and just poke away as Ari is kiting through. The flags fall on the... That's the two threats there for Besiktas. Take out the Ari. Giving Maokai a shutdown. But Daldrin getting chased out. Almost going to die to the crits. Double kill there. Goes to Warlock. And the tree falls as well. That's four for two in favor of the Titans. Yeah, four for two. And at this point in the game, Graves can still be super aggressive. So Ari and Graves dual assassins with their item timings. Death Cap, Morellanomicon, Infinity Edge, Static Shift is huge power spikes for 22 minutes. And the tankiness is just not there for Besiktas. They still need to buy time to get these items, but they're being punished, whether it's turrets, whether it's dragons. Bangkok Tide is just playing excellently around their win conditions. Yeah, and the gold lead starting to snowball a bit now as well. Closer to 4,000 ahead in this situation. You can see Nadi has got the two items, but could not peel all of that front line. I mean, he just got surprised. Ari showed up behind him and instantly killed him. I mean, they didn't have vision around mid for whatever reasons. Their minion, li when th their minion wave line had died, so they didn't have the, the vision of the creeps, and they seemed to be surprised by the flank from Ari, despite they were being surprised by a flank next to their inner turret. And again, it's just been Bangkok Titans' lovely positioning, playing aggressively up. Ari now building in towards Azonia, so not even going for the Void stuff quite yet. Doesn't need it, given that there's not even a locket being looked at right now from Besiktas. Just haven't been able to fit one into the rest of the builds. Fourth Dragon will be up for them in a mid at 45 as well. Besiktas currently still shot out of the objective. Everyone's getting stronger. Even Udi is getting massively tanky, looking for a Warmogs. And this is the worry for this sort of team comp. When you fall behind like this and you can't scale to the late game, doesn't matter how good your late game is if you never get there. And with the zone, is they have so many options of dealing with Nadius, who's definitely the person they're trying to focus fire on. We already mentioned Hecarim always has 80 carries written on his agenda to deal with in team fights, but Ari with Azonia suddenly can go for that aggressive dive, take the Hema Plague, just stasis through that damage. As long as, it, as long as he swaps his life for Jinxes, should be a team fight win for the Bangkok Titans. Sieging pretty difficult with an Udia especially, but they're getting a lot of work done. Besiktas really respecting the, the power of this Southeast Asian team. You have to respect the RA charm as well, because if you get poked down, things will start going very wrong. And Lloyd's able to position aggressively and deal good damage to this turret that's already at 50% health. And we brushed over Warlock for a second, but just to go back to the build, the Trinity Force coming through makes a lot of sense, but I love the MR here, because who's he trying to kill? It's the AD carry, and what does he need to worry about then after that? Only magic damage. The only thing he hasn't fit into his build is the Home Guard Enchant, which probably will have gold to pick up soon. Not rushing towards that just yet. Honestly, they haven't needed the flank engages from the Hecker, and they're doing it just fine from the Ari so far. And as you mentioned, the locket not being completed, much more selfish itemization coming through from Theocles on the Rex side. Probably the most obvious person to pick up the locket for the team. Fourth Dragon's coming down. Again, the stats from this one maybe not immediately relevant, but the timer just starts to go in the game, and it's going to be an early one. It's going to be 31 minutes if they can rush down this fourth Dragon. Yeah, and, or helping with the pushes, I guess at least semi-relevant. Just being able to snowball, push out some turrets, and then open up space for your fifth Dragon. It's, Dragon's so weird with the way it stacks and snowballs, but... They're little advantages, but when you stack them on top of each other, they add up to a very big snowball. So the home guard is completed by Hecarim, but isn't opting to stay in base, so only going to get him back to things. So no extra stats picked up, although he did finish the, warden, the Warden's Mail, so that will be relevant in a fight. This is finally the time. The fourth dragon of all is the time that Besiktas decide they have to hit the go button. But do they have enough to get a win a fight? I mean, Moss has his ulti. He might just disengage, although they maybe want to fight. They are going to start in there. Dragon getting low. They're actually going to go for a bit of a 50-50 in the backside. Dragon does go to Besiktas, but Energy, he's already down. Nadia so firing away from the back line, but the front line is melting for the Turkish team. Hook going wide there. 007X on top of the Jinx. And I'm sorry, Nadia, you have no nothing left to live for as the support gets another kill. And this team comp from the Bangkok Titans is really exposing one of the few weaknesses of Jinx. We've seen Jinx first pick was in Jinx priority in multiple regions. But when you have the world's tankiest front line, the likes of Udia, the likes of even support Gragas, which is very deceptively tanky from the support realm, you don't get excited. You're just a no escape AD carry that dies instantly. And going for the Baron now are Bangkok Titans. It's going to go down swiftly here as Dumbledore. The only man around that can possibly contest it, but he's not even going to make it to water while it's alive, I don't think. Nope, I tell lie, he goes in, doesn't throw the hook out though, and Baron goes to the tie side. So the smallest of advantages come through to Bishit as they do pick up the dragon. We're going to see the replay. At this point, it looked bad. G4 had already used his first ult charge, and I thought, okay, 
They're not going to be able to get into Nadia's. He's free hitting, but doesn't have that many items on Jinx. And the Super Mega Death Rocket, they just never became a situation where there was going to be a reset for that Get Excited. They're all so tanky. Even the Hecarim, above half health. 007X, less than half health, but this is Udia we're talking about. Jinx can do nothing, and she watches as her team loses the four members. Yeah, now 8,000 gold ahead for the Bangkok Titans as well. Luden's Echo completed now for the RE. Not the Zonias that we thought that I thought it might be. Going for much more aggression and overall team fight damage. A secondary giant spot to go with a Righteous Glory. The 007X has moved in. So that's the first one. He just finished a Righteous Glory because he wanted more aura items. Warlock now with a Frozen Heart, plus the Spectre's Cow and the Merc Treads. Three items done for Graves. It is looking troublesome for Besiktas. It's grim reading for this Turkish representative, the home team we have to remember across the map. Everything is looking wonderfully strong for Besiktas. Has actually gone for the Merc Treads here, has the uh, Ari just respecting, I guess, Dumbledore's CC, Maokai to some degree as well. It's looking to do consistent damage. Whenever you're a champion like Ari with short cooldowns, it's not necessarily about the burst damage at the start of a fight. It's kiting back, doing consistent damage to make up for the fact that Graves, he's all about burst from the AD carry Yeah, role. I know Spawn, one of our other commentators here, loves the Merc Treads right now, and it makes sense. In this sort of tanky meta with CC everywhere, Merc Treads are at a premium right now. I mean, they're just trying to break the base. They don't necessarily have the rage to do it. Graves, not the best turret CC you'd have to say. But Warlock's already strong. Of course, now has the Frozen Heart. Short cooldown that Rampage means plenty of Trinity Force procs. And Maokai, one of his few downsides is just can't stop people who do good turret damage because he doesn't have the damage to force them away. Yeah, tower goes down there. Just too much damage and Besiktas can't move in to fight. Bangkok Titans have the Greg Assault as well if they really want to commit to taking out structures. That's been one of the nice things we've seen coming through as Warlock going in a bit too aggressive. Needs to find the ulti. Tanking turret though. Loki comes in and Lloyd's walking around the side, but 007X is so tanky and G4 dives into the back line. Greg Assault splits everyone. Theocles gonna go low. Thousand dives as well. And the front line's dead for Besiktas. 007X dives into the back and that's 3-0. It's looking like the first big upset of the tournament here, Pastry Time, as Bangkok Titans in a very difficult game with a execution heavy comp have executed perfectly i thought their win conditions would be a bridge too far make one small slip and suddenly vlad and jinx run rampant through your team fight but they just can't kill the udia no and they've exploded now nadia eats it charm and goes down instantly to lloyd energy now gonna get dove here as well turrets melting in front of their eyes as is just to buy a little more time but energy melts as warlock gets a double that's the ace coming through for bangkok titans and they finish the game just destroying the Turkish side's first outing. And we wondered what the thing that Udia would contribute as this kind of a sideways pick, forcing Gragas into a support role, but was completely justified just because Udia could run at Jinx, and that's the one thing. Udia can definitely run at people. It doesn't always get to them, but in this case, it didn't matter because they couldn't kill any of the front line coming through. Gragas, uh, threat, Gragas in this game, of course, Gragas, into the Udia, into the Hecarim, just not killable from a Jinx perspective. Even with the Hema Plague spreading onto multiple members every fight, never got excited, just sat in the back line doing a little bit of chip damage, while the rest of the Aryan Graves especially run rampant through the Besiktas lineup. I mean, certainly when your front line is starting to melt to your opponent's carries, you sort of realize that the problems are everywhere, because it doesn't even matter if you can't peel the front line, because your front line dead, and all of a sudden you have nothing left to help you peel for and That's you. the thing, Jinx doesn't have self-peel, only has that passive, which makes her look like a mobile champion when she's winning, but for once we see her punish, just an immovable AD carry at the back, no front line to fight around, and Besiktas, just a very surprising loser this game. Bangkok Titans, they got their big victory. Yeah, very creative stuff there and a strong showing after what was a fairly uh, even early game, you have to think. We talked about it. Things were going well. They were farming away. And all of a sudden, the Bangkok Titans, their aggression finally rewarded, you have to think, because they were arguably over-aggressive in the early game. And they just took the ball and rang with it all the way to the end. Uh, but the thing is, they, they understood their win conditions, and I, I thought I asked a lot of questions about whether they could pull off. I think they pulled off everything with a plum. The flash from Graves especially was a complete highlight. We don't see that often in competitive play. Flashing for the buckshot kill onto the jungler, but it opened up another objective, it opened up their second dragon from memory. All the controlled aggression in the world. You know, sometimes when these teams lose, if they had lost this game, it would have been reckless aggression. But controlled aggression was the story from the Bangkok Titans. And it obviously took Besiktas off guard. Yeah, I mean, losing just that one dragon, I guess, towards the end was the one fault. But honestly, they won the team fight handily and just were able to push from there and take the Baron. So even that one dragon didn't matter too much. But we do have a replay now as well. So wait and see 
one of the big fights in this game. So there's only a 4,000 goldie at this point. This was a fight that actually looked like it go Besiktas's way before I remembered that nobody could die on this Bangkok Titans line. They're already so tanky. Look at these item builds. The one thing you mentioned actually earlier in the cast, no locket was ever completed for Theocles. Doesn't have it in this situation, but Udia, full tank, has the Cinder Hulk into the locket. At this point, Trinity Force already completed, then cost-effective armor and magic resist for the Hecarim. And, I mean, even, even Gragas can just sip on that Drunken Rage, has already a nice health stack, so I'll roll the tape in this situation. So I believe this is where the Dragon Steel, yes, this is where the Dragon Steel comes in. So the objective looks good in this case. They try to DPS down the Dragon. Ari's caught up. The Dragon falls down low. It's stolen away, which is wonderful. But look at this. Nadius is free hitting in the back line. It's just not doing any damage because no one falls low from Bangkok Titans. They have so many item timings. And Nadius needs what? A Bloodthirster and a Last Whisper to be relevant? Can't break, break through anyone. Udia running at you is suddenly a super scary thing because you don't have a gap because you're not Ezreal. You don't have the Arcane Shift to get away. She dies in the back line. That was just the story of what happened this game. Bangkok Titans, they took it over and they never looked like losing. Yeah, their lead, especially at that last fight, was just too much. I just noticed when we watched her back, Lloyd was the one trying to take away the dragon. That AD carry with two and a half, almost three items. He got zoned out completely. Couldn't get... Had to just try and free hit the jungler. Got zoned out by a thresh box trapped in the dragon pit. And it just didn't matter. I mean, look, if Lloyd, if the AD carry roll doesn't work out, there's plenty of other roles where you can flash in aggressively and blow people up. But man, he made Graves look good. Reminded me of actually Pinoy shooting onto the scene for Gambit Gaming and showing a lot of aggression against Double Lift of all people earlier this year. Much the same story here. Just so much aggression on the Graves that we don't expect. And Graves is a very early pick in multiple aggressive regions just for reasons like this. If the game ends early, if it's not relevant that you're a 525 range AD carry who often use, has to use his only steroid defense Defensively, if you can just quick draw, or in this case, flash in and blow people up, it looks great. It does look great. And I think for the Bangkok Titans, other teams will look at that game and I think have to feel quite afraid. Not only did they mix things up and... I'm going to say it, maybe trick Besiktas there in champs, like with the Gragas pick, at least open themselves up to a really cool flex pick there in that draft. It's not just picking the wacky things and, you know, having some fun and having a good early game. They executed wonderfully in the end, but we got them straight to an interview. Oh, you complete the league in the second place, but you just defeated one of the favorite teams in the tournament. How does it feel? Uh, of course, it feels great to win. Um, coming in second place, uh, it doesn't feel any dif different for us. We still think that we're a strong team, and it feels good to win, yeah. Uh, we have seen you play with your sub-support. Uh, what was the reason of this change? Um, we just decided that we wanted to play the game more. Th I mean, the game more uh, aggressively, and then you know our new support that we're bringing in is a more aggressive player and is able to make more plays. Uh, and yeah. So you have picked Gragas and Udir. Those were pretty unusual picks. Where did this strategy came from? Okay, so for Gragas, um, we okay. To be honest, we've like never practiced Gragas before. Oh God. Really? That's like the first game with the team, Gragas. But since the player is so new, we just wanted him to play whatever he feels comfortable. And, you know, so he wanted to play Gragas, we picked Gragas for him, and then we pulled it together. Um, for Udia, it's always been a strong jungler, and it's, uh, we just feel it works well with the team, so yeah. Okay. Thank you for the interview. Now, it's up to Chris. And welcome back, guys. And I have to say, Pretty impressive that they can go in with a, I caught a, a genius draft there and apparently just never practiced Gragas. So the YOLO strategy absolutely <laughs> pays off there for the Bangkok Titans. I, th I mean, that's the situation where sometimes you bite off more than you can chew and you're punished for a lack of practice on a champion. But in this case, they take away a meta pick, don't even use it in the jungle. Still very useful, but disengaged, still super tanky. And then an Udia runs all over a Jinx and they win the game. So sometimes it just works out. Sometimes it does. And wonderful stuff there from the Bangkok Titans. But we are going to take a quick break. And when we return, the coverage of the International Wildcard Invitational will return. <laughs> 